Welcome back to Nuts and Bolts Torqued. It's just about time to go to the moon, but before that I want to go over a couple things that are important to my mission to the moon, and also construct a little thing. So I've got my spacesuit ready, it's filled up with oxygen, that's all good. Uh, I do need to keep in mind though that the reason I'm going to the moon, the main point of it is to find the dilithium ore. Yeah, dilithium ore to find that. So if I want to mine tons of that, the best way is probably to use the digital miner. So I went ahead and stuffed the digital miner in my backpack here, but that presents another problem. How do I power the digital miner on a different planet? So what I'm going to do for that is something that I've used just a little bit. I haven't shown it in the series though, but off camera I used it a little bit. I made the quantum entangle porter from Mechanism. This thing is really nice. It, it's basically a uh, a limitless. You can connect this entangle porter with another one across any distance, across any dimensions you want, and transfer basically anything through it: power, items, gas, fluids. So I've got a setup here. At the moment, it's just taking in power. I'm not interested in doing items or anything with it. So the fact that this quantum entangle porter is connected to power means that I could place another one down anywhere in any dimension and connect it with that one and receive power. So that's what I'm going to use for power. It was very, very expensive to make, by the way. Let's take a look. What exactly did it require? Yeah, it required an MFSU. That was probably the hardest part because that there's tons of micro grafting to go up through the tiers of power units and industrial graft too. Because the MFSU takes the MFE and an advanced machine casing, and the MFE takes a basic machine casing and energy crystals, and energy crystals are compressed energium dust, which comes from all this other stuff. Yeah, it was a whole thing. It was pretty hard, but I got it made. So that's going to take care of the power problem. Now, one other thing is when I go to the moon, I don't want to have to rocket back and forth between the moon and here if I ever need to go back, which I'm sure I will at some point. So I want to set up teleporters. So I made some mechanism teleporters. I've got teleporter frame, the teleporter itself. I think you put like the teleporter down. I think just I think you just need one teleporter somewhere within the teleporter frame. Uh, it, it does need power. And I also have a portable teleporter, which is charged with 400,000 RF. Not sure how much power it takes per teleport, but this should allow me to teleport to any one of these teleporters from anywhere. So let's try to set one of these up and see if it works. Another reason I want to set it up is not just for easy travel between the moon and here, but also just to make sure I can get back. Because, like, I don't know how much fuel is going to be used up when I get to the moon, but what if I don't have enough fuel to get back? Yeah. Just want to be safe. So let's put it, I don't know, maybe over here. I'm not sure if there's, like, a particular shape it needs to be. I'm assuming it's just kind of like the nether portal. Probably. So, maybe I'll do, like... Uh, I don't know if it needs to be, like, connected on all sides, or if you can kind of cheese it, like with a, the nether portal where you don't put in these corners. But I'm going to put in the corners. Then I guess I'll put the teleporter... Wait, is this the right size? I don't know. Put it up there. No frequency, okay. Well, it looks like it maybe works. Well, let's just charge this thing up with some power. Oh, I need to make another HV connector. This is my last one. Leaf is in the way. There we go. Wow, that holds a lot of power. Oh, you can give it upgrades? Supported anchor. What does anchor do? Keeps the machine's chunk loaded. Oh, okay. Well, I don't really need that as an upgrade. I can just chunk load myself. Anyway. So, I guess I need to set a frequency, right? I'll just say... Home. 
Oh, no frame. Okay, apparently it is very particular about the shape, so it needs to be like this, and these these pieces down here do need to be filled in, unlike the nether portal. Alright, so now it just says no link. Uh, but it does have a frequency set, I think. Uh, let's just try the portable teleporter. Let's see if we can teleport to it. Teleport? Ah! Nice! And however much power it used, it seems to have filled up before I even checked. It's already up to 2 million. Um, how much does this have? What did this start? Wasn't that 400? So it only used... Did it only use 500 RF? That's nothing. I can teleport like a million times with this. Oh, I guess it doesn't use exactly 500 RF. Some sort of odd number, but still. Very, very little. Alright. I wish there was more fanfare with the teleport, you know? Like, a noise or something. It's just... Just silent. Just... Now you're here. <laughs> I want there to be like a cool effect and zooming through space and a, you know, a... Noise or something. Well, I guess we're all set to go to the moon. Oh, yeah. Uh, something worth mentioning is that... With the spacesuit, I'm not going to have my jetpack. There was actually something I could do with the spacesuit, though. It looks like you can attach an electric jetpack. Hello, zombie. Now, it's not the same as the backpack, which has the extra big battery. It's just a normal electric jetpack, which wouldn't last very long. But I guess I could do it. If I remember right, the electric jetpack is, like, really, really cheap to make. It's like three of these. Uh, I need some tin item casings. Ah, eh, you know what? Who cares? It's going to be the moon. I can probably jump super far anyway, right? Low gravity. Let's go to the moon. Probably put these on. There we go. Okay. Uh, what the heck? What is that little line? You see that? It's like this very, very thin line connecting the ship to the fueling station. Is that from the linker that I used to link the fueling station to the ship? If so, that's a very weird effect. It should be a lot thicker. It's like barely visible. Anyway. We're good on fuel, right? Uh-oh. Lag spike or crash? That's a crash. Shouldn't look to the fuel. Okay, this time I'm not going to check the fuel just in case it crashes again. So let's just lift off and hope we're okay. Um, I think that's... Yeah, so the very left side of the screen, I think that displays the fuel there at the bottom left. But I don't know, I've got like four sets of icons it looks like that are just all overlaying each other. So it's a total mess. Anyway, destination... Oh, Destination Luna. So I guess it did actually set the destination correctly when I put the chip in there. Space to take off. Got my suit on, right? Yep. Here we go. I'm so gonna die. <laughs> oh, I hope this space suit's pretty strong. Damn, this rocket's really slow. Oh, it's starting to speed up. Goodbye, Earth. Up into the clouds. We're at Y260. You can watch the sunrise. God, this looks so weird up here. At Y500. Some funky stuff going on with the sky. Alright, Y like 800 now. Oh, I see the top left of bar that's almost at the top. I'm assuming... Okay, yeah, once it reaches the top. 
guess we get to the moon. How are we going to come down onto the moon? Like, am I just going to be right on the moon, or are we going to land, or how's this going to work? Press space to descend. Auto descend in 20 seconds. What am I looking at? <laughs> what is this? All right, let's descend. This... Wait, I'm sorry, this is Luna? According to the mini-map and according to the green that I see all around me, this is... this doesn't look like the moon. Alright, well, we're jittering our way down. Why 600 or so? Wonder when this is going to turn into actual ground. So strange. Oh, well, well. Since so we're almost at the ground, but I don't see anything. Okay, here we go. Yeah, this is uh, apparently Luna. Full of green and chirping birds. I mean, it, it, <laughs> the entire place is covered in trees. Do I really need a spacesuit? Is there not oxygen? We're gonna land in a tree. Oh. Well, it is. It's definitely Luna. The sky's different, there's low gravity. We've landed our probably very heavy rocket on top of some leaves. This is so strange. This is not what I was expecting at all. How does the glider function in low gravity? Like, I wonder if you can just kind of like keep going up or... Oh yeah, this is another thing. I don't know if I showed this. I think I did this in between the old recording session and this new one after the break. Um, I made an advanced glider. It's just, it has more durability, it's faster. Pretty much it. You can see it's quite fast. Yeah, I was thinking, you know, if the moon looked pretty cool, I'd maybe want to build a base here, but there's no reason to build anything here. Looks basically the same as the normal world, just low gravity and different sky. Whoops, I just tossed my tool. Alright, well, I'm going to grab my mining stuff out of here. And I'm going to go mining down and just see if I can find some dilithium. And also see if there's any other unique ores on this place. It's possible there's other stuff more than just dilithium. But yeah, I'm especially looking for dilithium, and once I find a piece, I can use that to filter the digital miner to mine specifically for that. Well, I can't mine too deep, because we have the extreme darkness, and I forgot that because I have all this armor on, I can't use the night vision on my dark helm. But I did manage to mine in the dark till I found dilithium. Didn't take too long. Well, I guess I'll just leave it at that. Uh, let's build a portal here, so I can always come back. Okay, got the teleporter set up. Um, now I have the problem of powering it. I mean, I could use a quantum entangle porter, but I'd rather not just, like, leave that here. It's kind of a pretty expensive piece of machinery for just a simple teleporter. So what I'm going to use is something that I haven't shown you yet. The wireless RF transmitters. So I found these looking around and all the things I could make. It's from Extra Utilities 2. There's a block you can make. The wireless RF battery. So this thing basically wirelessly broadcasts. It just like stores the power that the wireless RF transmitters will then consume. So if you fill this thing up with power, and it's pretty cheap, just some redstone, some stone burnt, super cheap stuff. So you just fill that with power, and I've got that filled with power back at the base. If that is running, then you can use these wireless RF transmitters to use the, the power that's stored inside of the wireless RF battery. Each one, though, does use up some GP. The power system is sort of like the, I don't know what you call it, the proprietary power system of Extra Utilities too. 
Each one uses 4 GP. I've got plenty of GP to spare, though. Um, and they are quite limited, too. Each one only does 80 RF per tick, which is not that much. So I'm not going to use this to like, power my entire base. It's way too weak for that. But if you have any kind of remote things that just need a little bit of power, you can just toss this down and it works pretty well. So I think it'll work pretty well for this. I'll put down a couple. You can see if you right click it shows you what it's powering. Each one serving one tile, serving this. You can see it's filling up with power. Not sure how much it needs, but that should be plenty, I imagine. Let's also go ahead and chunk load this. There we go. So they should always remain powered and always remain accessible no matter where we are. There's Earth. All right, let's get the digital miner up and going. Now that we have a sample of dilithium. Let's take that out of our bag. I guess I'll probably store the dilithium inside of a drawer for easy transportation because I can use the packing tape to pack it. Okay, let's put it down wherever. <laughs> Christ. Uh, yeah, that works, sure. Oh, they're probably going to... Yeah, so they're going to try to supply it with power. That's fine, I guess. Why did it stop receiving power, though? Oh, no, it's still going up. Oh, that right, the 4.7 was the power that was already inside of the digital miner. I forgot that it, it keeps the power even after you break it. So that was already in there. Now it's just filling up very, very slowly. Should be fine, but it's going to need way more power than that, so we'll use the quantum entangle border. Uh, so this is the channel that I have set up at home, the power main. Let's set it to that. Um, oh, I might need to configure the sides. Oh yeah, everything's like an in input. So I guess I'll put everything to like an output. No, something's, something's still not working. Oh. Oh, I was on items. Whoops. Yeah, energy. Energy output. That should do it. No? Oh, there we go. I had to set it to auto eject on for some reason. Even though it was set to output, I'm not quite sure how that works, but it's fine. It's working now. Yeah, it's filling up pretty fast. And this thing is already filled up with maximum energy efficiency upgrades, and it's got one speed upgrade, which makes it use 2000 RF a tick. All right, let's configure this thing. Max radius, yep, max everything. So let's filter for dilithium. Oop, that's the wrong slot. And start, how many, oh, wow. Wow, 2,665, or six, I guess. My God, there's a lot of dilithium here. That's incredible. Okay. I Yeah, silk touch is off, which is good. I don't want silk touch. That just wastes tons of power. Auto eject. Let's turn that on. Let's see if it'll auto eject into a drawer. I don't know if it will. Uh, okay, so it doesn't. Oh, it's alright. I guess I'll just use a chest and then extract from the chest into a drawer. There we go. Got a chest. Got an ender IO cable just extracting out of it. So we've got 30 so far. We get about one every... Two or three seconds? Three, four seconds? So I could speed it up, but I don't think there's any particular reason to right now, actually. I mean, 2000 RF is about half of my entire power infrastructure's possible throughput, so if I speed it up more, it might be bad. In fact, we seem to be running out of power, if anything. Yeah, hmm. Well, anyway. I think I'll just leave that as it is, because I don't like desperately need dilithium right at this exact moment. I think I'll spend the rest of this episode probably going over the other changes that I've made in the interim to my base. So I'll just leave this, and when I come back, I guess it'll have thousands and thousands probably mined. Let's use the teleporter. Just make sure this thing works. All 
right, teleporting to here worked just fine. Try to go back. Yeah, all right, so we can go back and forth at will. Cool. All right, so let's go over some of the other things that I've changed. All right, let me show you the Batania stuff first. It's always fun to just like go into the water at terminal velocity and just pop through the surface of the bubble. Okay, so the basic center is pretty much the same. It probably looks a bit different. That's because I doubled the amount of of uh, Gormialysis we have. So it used to be just these five on this side, but I put another five on the other side and rearranged the center so that everything would be, you know, fairly symmetrical and nice looking. So now we make tons and tons of mana. And also, the uh, the addition of all these Gormialises did mean that I had to put some more Agricarnations here to speed up the growth of all these things. So there's a lot of Agricarnations here. This is just like the particle effect lag factory I've got going on here. But yeah, it works great. We don't run out of food or anything like that. Let's see. Oh, right. So I completely got rid of the rail cart system. It was very cool. Uh, I was very happy with how I designed it and everything, but the issue I was having is I was like, even though I've chunk loaded this entire place, you can see this entire underwater base is entirely chunk loaded. Despite that fact, it still seems like at some point, maybe when I'm first loading the world or maybe when I'm far away from it or something, it's not really quite keeping it chunk loaded enough to stop the water from falling down at some point, I guess. I haven't... Now, like, the water doesn't seem to fall down here. I've never seen these crops washed away. That doesn't seem to be an issue, but for some reason, stuff would just... with the cart would just stop working, and I'd come back here and check, and what had happened is water had somehow gotten down into the track system and washed away the tracks. So although, like, this bubble never seemed to have any problem, for some reason this one would sometimes just collapsed long enough to destroy the railcar system, and it did that multiple times. It was really annoying, and, you know, with everything chunk-loaded already, there's, like, nothing I can really do about it. It just seems to be some funkiness between chunk-loading and uh, the fact that the, the bubble flowers need to be active to keep the water at bay. Just between those two things, it just seems to produce some funky interactions that don't work all that great. So... A uh, verdict for the underwater base is it looks very cool, but it's not very practical and I wouldn't do it again because of the issues I have of the water coming down when it shouldn't. So I just got rid of the track system. Everything else survives the water coming down temporarily just fine. Apparently, because nothing else is washed away. And this also randomly shuts off, which I think also might be because of the water. It's no big deal. You just got to right click with the wand down there to start it back up again. Okay, so new stuff. Yeah, double the Gormialis' flowers, put more agricarnations over there to speed up the growth. Um, these parts are the same, but I did add in an automated rune system. Let me show you this thing working, show you it in action before I explain how it works. So each one of these chests represents one of the crafting ingredients in a rune. Let's use the fire, ru fire rune, for example. I've got the stuff here. So it takes these five things. So let's say I want to make three fire runes, so I'm just going to put each individual ingredient in a separate chest. Okay, put that stuff in, flip the switch, and... Pretty cool, huh? There's a little bit more delay between the crafts than I'd like, about three seconds, but it's still really cool. And it works beautifully. So let's start from the beginning. Let's go over how the items actually get put into the runic altar. So the whole thing is initiated with flipping this breaker switch. I wanted to make sure that you could just turn it on and off at will. So the breaker switch connects to this redstone circuit, and this is from, I forgot the name of the mod, uh, Super Circuit Maker, which I've never used before, kind of messing around with this. 
It's a very cool mod that it's it's been described basically as like chisel and bits for redstone. It allows you to make very, very small redstone things. So like you can just pop off those little pieces which went into <laughs> the range collector and you can make tiny little compact redstone circuits. So you can do stuff in a lot smaller sizes and also you can also do stuff that you just can't really easily do with vanilla redstone as well, not just making it smaller, but there's a lot more functions too. So I'm making use of the Ender Pulsar here. And what this does is, using a configurable time, 60 ticks is what I have it set to right now, which is 3 seconds, it will, every 60 ticks, it'll emit a pulse of redstone. And I have a redstone torch here to invert the signal coming in from this switch. Um, because how the Ender Pulsar works is it will emit a pulse so long as it is not receiving a redstone signal. If it is receiving a redstone signal, it won't emit a pulse. So a redstone signal disables the pulsar. And I wanted to make sure that when you turn the breaker switch on, it would enable the pulsar. Which is why there's an inverter redstone torch here. So that turns off the redstone torch, which means the Ender Pulsar is no longer receiving any redstone, hence it will pulse every three seconds. So that's the start of it. You flip this thing on, that makes the Ender Pulsar start to pulse, and that emits a pulse along here. So what is this redstone connected to? What is it pulsing for? Well, I've got um, XNet connectors on each of these chests. And I have them set, if we look in here, these are the chests that we extract from. I have them set to do one operation on a pulse. And they're set to extract a single item meaning when they receive a redstone pulse, they will extract a single item from each chest. So that is why when you put the crafting ingredients that you want into each of these chests, and you flip this, as soon as the pulse goes, it activates the extraction of a single item from each of these chests, and it puts it inside of this mechanical user that is beneath the runic altar. And this thing is just set to just activate the block with the item, so whatever you put in here, it's going to put inside of the runic altar. I also gave it tons of speed upgrades to make sure that it puts them in very fast. So that's kind of step one. You extract one item from each chest, put it in the runic altar. Okay, great. Now what? Um, so I'm reading the redstone using a comparator from the runic altar. And the comparator can tell you a couple things. The runic altar outputs a certain signal when... It outputs a certain signal when there's... When it's crafting a like when it has a valid recipe and it is in the process of crafting the rune and it also outputs a different signal when it's done crafting the rune and it's awaiting the living rock and the wand because remember once the rune is received the mana and it's done crafting you have to use living rock um, on the altar and then you have to right click it with the wand of the forest and then it actually crafts the thing so what I do is I'm reading the redstone coming out of this thing, and when this thing has a valid recipe and it's crafting, it outputs a certain redstone signal. I read that, and when I read that redstone signal, I output a redstone signal here, which turns off the pulsar. So in other words, we've just extracted the items, we're in the process of crafting, then I disable the pulsar so that we don't output more items, because I don't want to spam this thing with items, right? I want to make sure that we only transfer items in when we want to craft a new rune. And if we're in the process of already crafting one, then we don't want to craft a new rune. So this pulsar is disabled when we're in the process of crafting. Then, once it's actually done receiving the mana from up here and it's ready to be completed with the living rock and the wand, that outputs a different redstone signal, which we read. And I use that to output a redstone signal to both of these mechanical users. They're set to only turn on with redstone on. So when we read the redstone signal from this, that's telling us, hey, we're ready to finish it. It outputs a redstone signal to both of these, which then plops the living rock onto it and uses the wand of the forest, thereby finishing it. And then once it's finished, the runes pop out and get sucked up by this ranged collector. And yeah, I, I think that's it. So then once it's done crafting, the redstone signal goes back to zero, because there's nothing on the table, which we read, which then makes it so we stop outputting redstone here. So this thing, assuming you haven't switched it off, this thing will then go back to emitting a pulse, which then 
puts the items, you know, uh, sends the pulse here and extracts one item from each chest and repeat. Which is why it works for not just one rune, but as many runes as you want to craft. At least of one type. Yeah, it works really, really well. I'm super proud of it. I think it's a pretty clever system. Okay, I've got some really cool stuff over in this room. So this is the the final Batania stuff that I've done. I can't remember whether I showed this or not. This is just a very simple... You know what? I think I did show this. This is the pure daisy that makes the living rock and the living stone. Just a very quick and easy way to make it. I'm pretty sure I showed that. But these are the super cool things. So... I'm, sometimes I'm in need of leaves from Botania to make flowers and stuff like that, but also it's sometimes nice when I need a specific type of dye. Uh, you know, there's so many different colors. There's 16 colors in Minecraft. Each of these slots represents a different color. There's all these different dye colors that I sometimes need, and typically I just don't actually have much, if any, of that particular type of color. Especially if it's not one of the easy ones like, like red. You know, you typically find a lot of red flowers, but not really so much like brown and stuff. I don't even know if brown flowers exist in Devol Minecraft. Uh, but anyway, so for the sake of getting lots of leaves for any flowers that I need and for having dye for anything that I could possibly need, I wanted to auto-generate the Batania flowers. So I tried to keep most of the technology that I used for this system within the Batania mod. I thought that'd be kind of fun. So what I've got going on here, I've got these floating jaded amaranthuses. And these will just take mana from a nearby pool and generate Batania flowers. So I've got four of them, and they are what is making these flowers appear all around. So that grows the flowers. Next problem is we need to collect the flowers, and we do that using this Drum of the Wild. So we've got a Pulse Mana Spreader here. This will take mana from this pool right here, and every time it receives a redstone signal, which it's getting every... How often? 18 seconds? 18 sand equals 18 seconds? So every 18 seconds it'll send a mana pulse to this drum of the wild. This is a sound muffler beneath it, by the way, because it's very loud without that. So every time this drum of the wild receives a mana pulse, which you'll see in just a couple seconds here, it will break all the flowers. There we go. It'll break all the flowers that are planted normally. Um, these jaded amaranthuses do not break because they're floating. They're not actually planted. Otherwise, that would suck. <laughs> so that breaks them all. And then over here, I have a floating hopper hawk, which will uh, collect anything in the range that you see. Let me let me get my wand of the forest so you can actually see the range. I think if I do that, there we go. So yeah, everything within this range will be picked up by the floating hopper hawk. And it'll put it into a chest that's nearby, which is this chest. Apparently we have some dirt. I'll take that. And then just transfers it into this little system and fills it up. Yeah, I think it's a pretty cool little system. I like it. It's fun to just watch. And I think these can hold quite a bit. Yeah, each one's stack limit 52. Okay, so over here I have my dirt generation. So I wanted to just generate dirt without having to go mine it or anything like that. And I wanted to see if I could do it using Batania, and it turns out you can. So it started with looking for how to make dirt in Batania, and I found that there's a wand. No, rod? It's a rod. Yeah, the rod of the lands from Batania will place, like when you have it in your inventory and you're using it, it will place a dirt block using mana, which is great, but that's not automation, right? I needed some, some. I wanted to see if there was some way to use the Rod of the Lands in an automated way, and it turns out there is. Okay, I'm just gonna put a sound muffler block here. Ah, oh, much better. Okay, so it turns out any of these rods, there's various of them that do all sorts of different things. Any of these rods from Batania can be automated by placing them inside of living wood avatars, which is what these are. So you place a living wood avatar down, and then you give it a rod. You can see they're all holding the rod of the lands. And if you supply the living wood avatar with mana, as I'm doing for each one of these, they'll use the wand. So I just made a bunch of living wood avatars, five of them, gave them all rods of the land, supplied them with mana, and they place down dirt. 
So then I started thinking of how am I going to collect it? I mean, it'd be there's lots of easy ways to collect it using mechanical users and whatnot and block breakers, but again, I'm trying to keep it within Batania. So uh, I place down another pulse mass spreader, just like the one over there. Activates every second. Taking mana from here and shooting it across, but uh, a mana beam itself normally does not break blocks. But there is a lens. Let me take this real quick. Boop. The Bore Mana Lens. So if you put that on a mana spreader, it makes the mana beam actually able to break blocks. You can see it stop breaking blocks. Let me put it back on. There we go. So I put that on there, and that allows me to break blocks. And then I have a similar setup here to the flower over there, where I've got the floating hopper hawk that collects the dirt blocks. You can see it's... I placed it so that it's just in range of all of the dirt, but not in range of collecting the flowers. Didn't want it to accidentally collect flowers. Oh, got an ink sack somehow. So it collects the dirt, puts it in here, and then stores it in the drawer. Speaking of, I have 21, almost 22,000 dirt. Nice. <laughs> and that's not even close to how much I can store. That's only 343 stacks out of 832. Which... is that the best storage upgrade? I've got it full of emerald ones. Yeah, so it's absolutely full of emerald ones and a single void upgrade. So it's basically as much as you could possibly store in a storage drawer, it looks like. Unless I wanted to not void it, but I definitely do. I think that should be enough dirt for anything I could possibly conceivably want to make. Hmm, so I went back to check Luna and see how the extraction was going of the dilithium ore. We've got 221 and I noticed it wasn't going up. So something strange happened. It's not that it's run out of power or just stopped working or anything, it's just when I originally scanned it said something like 2000 to mine. But now I've got 221, there's none in the chest, and there's none to mine. Which honestly seems much more reasonable. 221 seems reasonable for a, what is it, a 32 block radius? Much more than 2,000, but I wonder why it said 2,000. Well, I think 221 dilithium ore should be pretty good for quite a while. Each one can be crushed down in the crusher into two dilithium dusts. Uh, which means we can make 442 capacitors. I think that'll be fine process at all. Oh yeah, do you want to see it go through the conveyor belt system? It's kind of cool. Look at it jitter around and be all weird. Beautiful. And it falls in. And eventually we have a roughly even amount of distribution on each one and each one should be running. Right about now. Or now. There we go. That all gets pumped into here. Uh, I was going to show you the astral sorcery stuff now, but there's one other thing I forgot about. So remember how a long, long time ago, feels like forever ago, I had a rock hounding system up and going for processing the uninspected minerals? I think it was like, I think it was, yeah, it was below here. It was like this horrible system that <laughs> didn't work very well, and then I just ended up kind of abandoning it and disassembled it a while ago and said that I would make a better system. Well, I did. So it is over here. Where's my glider? It is much better. It's fairly automatic as long as you supply it with the base materials, and it's also incredibly fast because, as you can see, I just massively parallelized it. There's tons of everything. So, um... Let's go through it. I'm trying to remember how this works. It's been forever since I set this up. So it ended up being a bit of a logistical nightmare just because there are so many different crafting ingredients that has to go into this thing. For one, we have four basic fluids. And each one of these... Each one of these rows of three lab ovens makes one fluid, so these three make one type, these three make another type, and so on and so forth. So we've got the sulfur making sulfuric acid, we've got the carbon making the syngas, we've got the sodium chloride making the hydrochloric, and the fluoride bearing compound making the hydrofluoric, 
all of which gets pumped into the mineral analyzers and the chemical extractors. And um, let's see, so this whole thing is... Oh yeah, we also have the mineral sizers over here. I think I've got three of these working on the uninspected minerals, which I have a space for here. It's empty at the moment. And then I've also got three running on the granite. The granite is used to make the fluorite bearing compound of... Oh, if I remember right, right? Mineral sizer. Yeah, so you grind up granite and it directly makes the fluorite bearing compound. Don't know how that works. Didn't supply it with glass or anything, but I'm not going to complain. So I'm trying to think if I should be kind of hand wavy with some of these details. Well, these are the base materials that I need to supply everything with everything it needs to work. So we need the uninspected mineral and we need the granite to grind up. Uninspected mineral comes from the astral sorcery place. I just manually bring that over whenever I feel like starting this thing up again. Uh, the granite is actually generated right here. So the igneous extruder I found from thermal expansion is actually able to create granite. You can actually tell it to create either cobblestone granite or obsidian, as long as it's supplied with lava and water. So this thing produces the granite, which I then extract to put over there. Um, it's supplied with water from this tank here. And it's supplied with lava from the magma crucible right next to it, which just uses RF to melt down cobblestone into lava. So it's a fairly self-contained system as long as you supply it with, you know, power, water, and, and some cobblestone to melt down. Gives you the granite. Um, you just put gunpowder into here, and it goes into this extractor from IC2, which makes it into sulfur dust, which is used for the sulfur-bearing compound. And the coal is for the, obviously, the cracked coal compound, and the glass is to make all the test tubes and stuff like that, the irons to make the grinding gears. So... Most of the stuff goes into these two crafters from RF tools, which I've never shown how these work on screen. So these are the crafters that I'd been meaning to make for a long time, but was never able to because they were just too expensive. They're incredibly powerful. They allow you to make all these different types of recipes, all within one machine. Uh, I'm going to be kind of hand wavy with how exactly this works, because I'm sure I'll be using crafters at some future time and I can go over this. It's a little bit complicated, honestly. A lot of finesse went into this to make sure this thing doesn't overfill or anything like that. Uh, but basically you just supply this with all the ingredients and it makes all the compounds and stuff and this one makes like the gears and some coal and some test tube stuff. And that all goes to the appropriate place, comes into here and then it's all extracted out of these chemical extractors into this huge bank of dusts. Which means I have honestly pretty much like practically unlimited resources for the basic stuff. Like you can see I have 25 100 iron dust and 3300 copper dust so for those i have just tons some other stuff like gold are a bit more rare and titanium as well is pretty rare but for the common stuff uh not an issue at all i guess now would actually be a good time to mention how i'm getting the coal so the coal process is a little bit complicated and ties into why i was trying to speed up the tree growth over there and why i said that it still wasn't fast enough so to make the cracked coal compound or is it right here? Yeah. For a single, a single carbon compound takes four cracked coal compounds, and each cracked coal compound takes three coal. I'm not sure how many coal that adds up to to make a single carbon compound, but it's a lot. So I needed like a renewable resource, a renewable way of getting tons of coal. The best way I could find is over here at the tree farm. It turns out that Charcoal, which comes from burning wood, can be used to make coal. So charcoal can turn into coal. But it's very inefficient. So this tree farm is extracting the wood out to here, and then I'm extracting the wood to these powered furnaces, which are then just burning it down into charcoal lumps, which then gets put here. So we have tons of charcoal lumps. Each charcoal lump can be turned into three coal pellets, and with, I believe it's eight coal pellets. Yeah, so eight coal pellets in this shape makes one piece of coal. So like, what is that? Like two and two thirds of a piece of wood creates one coal. So I've got that, uh, I've got the charcoal lumps pumping into this crafter. 
pumping into here and it's creating coal which then gets extracted over here and made into carbon compound but yeah we just consume massive amounts of coal like it's unbelievable how much we make let me actually do the math and see how much it takes to make one carbon compound Okay, so if I've done my math correctly, then I believe it takes roughly 32 pieces of wood. Not planks, but actual raw pieces of wood from the trees to make a single carbon compound. Because each carbon compound takes four cracked coal compound, and each cracked coal compound takes three coal. So for one carbon compound, we have 12 pieces of coal. And for each piece of coal, it's about two and two-thirds of a piece of wood. So yeah, about 32 pieces of wood for one, one carbon compound. So yeah, I need to produce wood very, very fast. I've actually got a pretty neat idea that's going to require some interesting new stuff that I've never gotten into to try to make wood extremely fast. Um, but I guess I'll go over that a different time. I was going to go over the astral sorcery stuff to finish up going over all the things that I had done off camera, but um, I think this episode is kind of going a bit long and my voice is kind of going too because I've been <laughs> talking constantly. So I think I'm going to end this here. I hope you've enjoyed so far, and when I return, I'm going to go over the astral sorcery stuff that I've done and also get into some new stuff.